righty, I want to welcome everybody at the 288 campus, the Friendswood campus, the Alvin campus, the Webster campus, everybody joining us in our online campus. How are you doing today so far? Everybody good? Everybody good? I'm good. I'm glad you're in church with us today. Uh, for the next three weekends, we're going to be doing something very timely and something I think that's very important for all the families in our church, but uh, truth is you go back two months. Actually, you can pr probably go back just a month, and this was not on the schedule. This was not on the calendar, what we're about to do, but uh, I really feel like God um, pushed me this direction uh, to, to talk about this, and so, and so we're going to talk about it. But first, let me set the stage uh, with an important truth, and the truth is this. You cannot get to where you want to go until you admit where you are. You cannot get to where you want to go until you admit where you are. It's, uh, it's true spiritually as well. You cannot get to where God wants to take you until you admit where you are right now. That's just a, that's a truth of life. It, it works with our map programs as well. I don't know if you know this, but if you've ever used the map program on your phone, which I did the other day, by the way, I was pulling out of a business over in a subdivision over toward Missouri City. Normally, I'm pretty good about finding my way around, but I was deep in the heart of the subdivision and... And uh, I say typically I kind of have a, an inner feel for which way is north, south, east, and west. Any of you, any of you like that? I kind of have that in my head. And so I kind of know which direction I'm going. I had no clue. I had no clue. So I'm about to pull out, and, and, and I didn't know which way to go. So I hit the home button on my phone that was on the map program that would take me home. And, and I'm sitting there waiting, and it's just circling. It's, it, you know, doing this and trying to find me, trying to find me, trying to find me. And, and it was busy where I was about to pull out and, and, and lots of traffic. And then somebody pulls up behind me. And I'm like, oh, now I got to, now I got to make a decision. And I'm looking at my phone and it's still not telling me. I can't find where I am. And so I, I did what you have to do at that point before you start getting beeped at. I, I chose the direction and I went and guess what? I, I, I chose the wrong direction. Thank you for, <laughs> my goodness, is that how much you think of me automatically? <laughs> But I chose the wrong direction. Out of the two choices I had, I went the wrong direction. I ended up in a, in a school zone that took forever. And, and then I ended up at a light. And I kid you not, I was at the light for four cycles of the light. There was so much traffic. It was going so slow, waiting to get through. It took me four, all while going the wrong <laughs> direction. But it's a, it's a truth of life if you don't know where you are, you can't get to where you want to be. And if you, and you can't get to where God wants to take you until you admit where you are. It's, it's true spiritually. It's true with our salvation. Listen, you can't get salvation from God and go to heaven someday until you admit that you're a sinner, until you admit that you need salvation. So a truth of life, okay? So we're just going to admit some truth today about where we are personally in our families. And let me give you a bigger picture of you, first of all. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, food prices are now 8.8% .8 higher than they were this time last year, which is the biggest 12-month increase since May of 1981. Chicken and beef hit an all-time historic high this past week. The USDA says food prices will go up another 5 to 6% this year. Home values in our area rose 11.4% over this time last year. Awesome, awesome, if you're selling your home, right? <laughs> if, you're, if you're staying put, not, not as awesome, uh, because with every rise of home value, your property taxes go up, 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 have you noticed that? Up, up, up. Have you also noticed prices, uh, uh, taxes never go down, 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 only up, up, up? According to AAA, when I checked early this past week, according to AAA, the average price of a gallon of regular gas in Texas was $4.24. Uh, average across the United States was uh, uh, around four sixty. <clears throat> I think it was Wednesday night. Overnight, the price per gallon average uh, went up eight cents overnight. Eight cents overnight. Uh, J.P. Morgan, Fox News, CBS News, all the news channels that are willing to talk about it are reporting that gas is expected to be over $6 a gallon by August. That's a few months away. If you're blessed to have a 401k, then you've learned over the past little bit to not look at your 401k. 
because it has not been pretty. I could go on and on. We could talk about the uh, insane lumber prices, construction prices, building material prices, a trip to the Home Depot or to Lowe's will show you what I'm talking about. Uh, we could talk about the soaring prices for cars, both new and used, but I'm hoping that you get the point, which is why we're gonna take the next three weekends. We're gonna talk about personal finances in a, in a series that we're calling Cost of Living. Now, as you know, we teach the Bible at this church. Somebody say amen if you already knew that. Okay, so we teach the Bible at this church. So uh, that's because we believe the Bible is living and active and it's able to change us where we need to be changed. We're all about God's word here at this church. And, and so maybe there are some folks right now who are wondering, well, then why are we talking about this when we should be talking about this? This is an easy one here, easy answer for this. Because this talks a lot about this. In fact, in the Bible, God has given us 2,350 verses about how to handle finances and our possessions. Jesus talked more about this subject than he did about faith, than he did about love, more than he talked about heaven and hell combined. That's because God knew that we would need lots of help in this area of our lives. And there's some good reasons for his guidance. One is because money is God's biggest comp competition or his greatest uh, competition, his biggest competitor. This is why Jesus once upon a time said it this way in Matthew chapter six. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And just so there was no misinterpreting what Jesus was talking about, about these two masters, he says this, you cannot serve both God and money. So when it comes to our time and our attention and our focus and our commitment and our allegiance and our desires and our trust, money is God's greatest competition. Which is why a long time ago, the leaders of our nation actually put it on every piece of money that maybe you can find, uh, dollar bills, coins, uh, a phrase. Does anybody know what the phrase is? In God we trust, in God. It's like, it's like if we start to trust in the money, we can just grab a dollar bill and hold it up to the sky and look at it and the dollar bill will say, don't trust me, don't trust me. Trust in God, trust in God. Now, not only can money be a source of conflict in our relationship with God, but it's also a source of conflict in our marriages as well. In fact, studies say that often it is the number one reason for conflict between spouses. Depending on what study you read, it's one of the top reasons for divorce as well. And I think it's probably likely today, law of averages says that there are some families among us today in church at our campuses that feel like this right here. That you're under increasing financial stress and the way that it's manifesting itself is, the way that you're is, is in the way that you're treating one another. And uh, maybe you cannot even bring up the subject of money or finances without one of you losing it. I'm just gonna tell you right now at the beginning of all this, we need to lose that reaction so that we can figure out where we are so that we can get to where God wants to take us. And, and here's where many people are right now, according to the current statistics, current as in early last week, two out of three people listening to me right now are living dangerously. And I say living dangerously because two out of three people are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, honestly, that's not unusual because that, that's actually been higher in the past, that, that uh, that fraction, that percentage, it's been higher in the past, but the reason I'm saying it's dangerous today is because of the rising cost of living. If you were living on a tiny margin before, if the cost of living continues to go up, it puts you in an increasingly dangerous place. And statistics say two out of three people are, are here right now. And so just to recap, <clears throat> there's a real and increasing financial danger in the world today. If, if we're married and under financial stress, it could show up in our marriage, this financial strain. And there's also danger in our relationship with God if our trust is in the wrong place. I, all I'm doing right now is I'm saying the truth out loud so that we can do something with it. We gotta know where we are if we wanna get to where God wants to take us. And right now, there are a lot of bad choices, bad opportunities to crash and burn financially. 
And as a church, we, what we could do is we could just park the ambulance at the bottom of the hill and wait for people to crash and burn and try to help them. And we will continue to help as we can. But I got a better idea today. I got a better idea. Why not meet people where they are right now before they crash and burn and try to help them steer their lives toward financial peace by teaching the principles found in God's word? That's why we're gonna do what we begin today, this series, Cost of Living. And I think this is gonna be good for a lot of our folks. And <clears throat> it might not sound like it at this point, but I'm a very, very positive person. I am. Uh, I'm very positive about the future. And I know a lot of people aren't right now, but I'm very positive about the future. Here, here's, here's why I'm positive about the future. Because I know God wins. I know God wins. Somebody say amen if you know God wins. God wins. Okay, that's a big picture view. God wins. Woohoo! But what I'm thinking about now as I, as I see the cost of living going up and up is I'm wondering about our families. I know God wins, but how are our families doing? How are, how are you personally doing? And so... My hope is that by the end of this series, you're going to be closer to God. You're going to be, if you're married, closer to your spouse. And you're going to be closer to true financial peace, no matter what this crazy world throws at you. So let's do this. Let's buckle up. Let's jump into God's word. And let's see where he takes us. And uh, I've just got three principles for you today. Not, not in order. Okay, not in order. But I'm going to begin here today. The first one on our map to financial peace is enjoy the blessings God has already given you. It's one that escapes many people, but you gotta enjoy the blessings that God has already given you. What we're doing right now is we're just trying to locate ourselves on the map of uh, God's financial principles. And, and listen to me, if you cannot be happy with what God has blessed you with today, you're gonna have trouble tomorrow and the day after that. This is all about Living within your means, living within your means. Now I know something about every single person at every single campus today. You have clothing. Otherwise I would have received a text by now. Uh, <clears throat> you have clothing. But what happens to us is we wake up one day and we go look at our clothes and we say what? We say I don't have anything to wear. Technically that's not true, correct? It's not like somebody, and this is never going to happen, where you wake up and you take a shower and you go into your closet to get your clothes out, and there's no clothes. And you go to the drawers, there's no clothes in your drawers. Now that person can say, I don't have anything to wear, and that would be, that would be true. But for most of us, it's not true. What's, what's true is that we wake up one day and we're dissatisfied with what we have currently. And so we just write off those blessings. And we do the same thing, not just with clothes, but we do it with our vehicle. We wake up one day and we don't like our vehicle anymore. We wake up one day, we don't like our house anymore. We, we wake up one day, we don't like uh, where we end up shopping, where we have to shop. We don't like our phone anymore. We just wake up with dissatisfaction. Listen to me, if you're not thankful for what you have now that God has blessed you with, why would he bless you with more? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in Philippians chapter four. He says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. He says, I know what it is to have nothing or next to nothing. How many of you, come on, confess. How many of you know what that feels like? Anybody know what that feels like? Okay. He says, I know what it is to have plenty, meaning I know what it is to have more than I actually need. Again, confession. How many of you know what that's like? Okay, so we've, a lot of us have been there, done this. He says, I know what this is like. I know what it's like. And what happens though, hey, uh, if we're going to learn the lesson that he gives here to us, is we got to learn not to compare ourselves with others. I think most money problems begin when we get up and we don't have as much. I'm not saying in great need. I'm just saying we don't have as much as someone else. We start comparing what we have to what other people have. And all of a sudden we feel dissatisfaction. I got to tell you something today, folks. There's always going to be somebody who has more than you. Always. Somebody, you're, you may have nice things. You may have a nice house and all that. But here we go. Somebody's got a nicer house than you. Somebody you're like, who? Who is it? <laughs> there are people 
who have nicer vehicles than you, people who have more toys than you. In fact, we live in a world right now, if you have a billion dollars, if we have a billionaire at church today, first of all, I'd like to talk to you after the services. (laughs) And secondly, even if you have a billion dollars, newsflash, there are people that got a lot more than you. You got a hundred billion, there are people with more than that, which is crazy. But that's the world we live in. And you just gotta come to terms with the fact and come to grips with it that there's always gonna be somebody who has more than you. But don't let what somebody else has cheat you out of enjoying what God has blessed you with. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. Do not let what somebody else has cheat you out of enjoying what God has blessed you with at this point in your life. One example would be this. If you have an old car, nothing wrong with old cars or trucks. Amen. (laughs) But if you have an old vehicle, show it some love. Show it some love. Like, like wash it. (laughs) And, 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 and vacuum it out and put the armor on the dashboard and Put the tire shine on because it's not finished until the tires have tire shine on them. That's like the icing on the cake. You got to put that on there. But show some love is what I'm talking about. The reason I'm saying this today is because here's what happens to a lot of people. The moment they get dissatisfied with something, they quit taking care of it. I saw it at the Astrodome. Years ago, you know, when they were wanting to get a new dome, wanting to get a new stadium, which is all about the luxury boxes with the, which the owners keep 100% of. But when they wanted to get, they quit taking care of the Astrodome. I went there for a game, went into one of the stalls in the bathroom and there was no toilet. There was just a hole in the ground with duct tape over it. And I said, these people have quit trying because now they're full court press to get a new stadium. But that's what happens to us in our lives. When we get dissatisfied with something, we stop taking care of it. And just use your car as an example, take care of it. Take it in for maintenance, treat it like you love it. Treat it like you are glad that you have a vehicle that God has blessed you with at this time. The question again, why in the world would God give you more if you don't take care of what you've already been blessed with? Jesus said, if you've been faithful with little things, then you'll be given more. And, and this is not Jesus, this is me. Jesus said, if you've, been, if you've been faithful with little things, then you'll be given more. Now it's Tim, okay, just me. But if you're moping around and dissatisfied with what you currently have, why on earth do you think God would bless you? Why would he give you more if you're not thankful for what he's already blessed you with? So. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So he's gonna give us a secret. In verse 13, here comes the secret, but before we get to his secret, let me give you one secret that's true in life today. Most people are in debt debt up to their eyeballs. Most people, and it does not matter the neighborhood or how big the home, or how nice the vehicles, you go through any neighborhood, most of the people that you see right now are in too much debt. Add to that fact that two out of three of us are, are living paycheck to paycheck. We end up, we end up here, here's what debt is, we end up buying money so that we can buy more stuff and then we're deeper in a hole. That's what debt is. Debt is, I want this but I don't have any money so I'm gonna buy money and pay for that And now, not only do I have to pay for that, but I have to pay interest on the money that I bought the thing with. When you can't afford the thing, you have to buy money to buy the thing. And then you owe twice, basically. And the worst thing about this is this kind of consumer debt, we often buy things of depreciating value. So the moment that we drive off the lot, the moment that we get the furniture delivered or whatever it is that we bought on credit, it's instantly worth less than we paid for. We're underwater instantly. We bought a depreciating asset with borrowed money. And it all goes back, I think, to us not being content with what we have right now. Paul said, I know the secret. I know the secret. I know the secret. Do you want to hear the secret? It's in verse 13. Do you want to hear the secret? Okay, one guy. (laughs) Just you listen. Everybody else plug your ears. (laughs) I can do all this through him who gives me strength. 
Some of you recognize it this way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's another translation. Most people think this is to help us win the ball game, the football game, to get an A on the final exam. What this is, Paul's really talking about here is, I can be, I can be content in any situation because of Christ. I can be, whether I have a little bit or I have a lot, I can be content. Now, there's nothing wrong with upgrading your life, Beyonce. Thank you for listening to the sermons. But to do so, you gotta upgrade your income, which we'll talk about next week, so please come back, okay? Uh, but this is part of economics class that most people missed or didn't listen to. And that is, we have to learn to live within our means. Live within your means. Act your wage. <laughs> Something that no one in Washington, D.C. knows anything about. <laughs> Don't encourage me. Okay, encourage me just a little bit. Some, okay. Somebody in Washington's got to put on their big boy pants and they got to stop the insane spending, spending money we don't have. And we're, we're, we're killing our kids' future and our grandkids' future. I, there's a brick wall out there somewhere. I don't know where it is, but there's a brick wall for this nation out there somewhere. And we got to grow up and we got to quit spending more than we have. I'm telling you what, if I could get a copy of the budget, it had to go through me for the United States, give me a Sharpie, and I could balance the budget in three hours. But we need, we need to get to a point where we're acting like adults again in this nation for the good of this nation and for our children. Amen? <clears throat> <clears throat> now, personally speaking, whether you have a little or a lot, Enjoy and thank God for what you've been given. Probably one of the most beautiful things that I have seen, and, and I'm sure you'll agree with me when I describe it, is if you're out somewhere and you're driving along and you see a home, and it may not even be an opulent home, maybe just a modest home, but it's well cared for, and the grass is mowed, and there may be a, a couple of of planters up by the front door with some beautiful flowers in them. And then there's a little sign on the door that says like, welcome or, or blessed or whatever. And then, and there's a older car sitting in the driveway, but it's washed and it's got the tire shine on the wheels. And when you drive by, you know something about that person. You know that they are thankful for what they have, just like all of us should be. So question, are you there? Remember, we're trying to locate ourselves. Are you there? Or are you living in a perpetual state of discontentment and dissatisfaction? Maybe tonight, if you just wanna recalibrate this and, and uh, start moving in the right direction, you could spend a few minutes, just walk around your house, maybe walk around your vehicle. <clears throat> and just as you see things, just thank God. Thank God for what you have. Just thank God for what you have. I once heard someone say, if we woke up today with only the things we thank God for yesterday, what would we have? How about we thank God for everything today, right? Secondly, if we're gonna get the financial peace, expect the unexpected, expect the unexpected. A recent survey found that six in 10 people couldn't handle a $1,000 emergency. So if something happened, you know, uh, they, 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 they would be in trouble. They would be in trouble. And uh, two, to, two, two out of three of us are living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, uh, obviously, that's not good because if we can't cover a $1,000 expense, what's going to happen if we have that expense? We're going to grab a credit card, go deeper into debt, get caught in that downward cycle of debt. This is taking a wrong turn on the road to financial peace. This is taking an exit that God doesn't want us to take because we were not prepared. And I'm just, I'm very positive. I'm, I, listen, I'm a very positive person. And right now, I'm just being positive with you that something in your life will break. I'm positive. 
Because that's what things do. You have unexpected expenses. How many of you would agree with that? Things just break sometimes. Okay, so what do we do with that? What do we do with that? We expect the unexpected. I love the way the Living Bible puts it in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8. The wise man does what? The wise man looks ahead. The fool attempts to fool himself and won't face the facts. So if you're wise, you're going to look ahead. You're going to say, you know what? I need to be ready for some things. I need to be ready. I need to put some money aside. Um, because that's what wise people do. Wise people look ahead. If you're foolish today and you haven't looked ahead and haven't put any money back, you can become wise today. Just face the fact, the truth, the truth of life. And the facts are these, that things you have break and there will be unexpected emergencies. Just get ready for those things. By the way, they're not really unexpected because we know they're gonna happen. Wow, I thought my washing machine was gonna last forever. I never thought I would have to fix anything. No, not, you know something. You know something's gonna need to be fixed. You already know, so it's not unexpected. It's unwanted. It's unwanted, and, though, and so a lot of people just bury their heads in the sand. Now, this is an easily answered diagnostic question to find out where you are just by asking the question, are you here? Are you ready for the unexpected? If you're not, it's time to get ready. How do you get ready? Well, you get at least $1,000 into a savings account somewhere for emergencies only. And I've been asked this question, and it's a good one. How do you get $1,000 into an account when you don't have $1,000? That's a good question, isn't it? You work more hours. You find uh, another job that you can maybe take on for a little bit. You, you go out to your garage, and you walk around, and you find everything that you haven't touched in six months and you put it out in the driveway and put a sign on it and sell it. You go into your house and you look in your sofa cushions and all the drawers. You go into your kid's room, you take all of their money. It's a team effort. It's a team effort. But you get $1,000 as soon as you can into that account and you don't touch it until there's an actual emergency. We can kind of clarify what emergencies are next week when we get together. But Here's the thing, no more wrong turns on this road to financial peace. This is the thing, this right here, is the thing that can trip a lot of people up. Like they're going toward financial peace, but they haven't put some money back for the unexpected, and then the unexpected, the unwanted happens, and they take that detour, and it takes them forever as they're stuck in traffic with a lot of other people going the wrong direction too. If you want to move toward financial peace, expect the unexpected. And then finally, and most importantly, that's why I saved it for last, Trust God, not money. Trust God, not money. Every good thing in your life, every blessing that you have comes from the hand of Almighty God. Amen? James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Meaning everything good, everything good in your life comes from God. That's the blesser. And it's important that we put the blesser above the blessings. The blesser has to be first, not the blessings. Put the blesser before the blessings, the blessings continue. If you put the blessings before the blesser, the blessings stop. Why would God give you more of what you are erroneously trusting in? If you're not trusting in him and you're trusting in the blessings. That's why Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter six. Do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows what about you? He knows that you need them. So you, you need things to eat and to drink and to wear and a place to live and all. He knows that you need that stuff. So what do we do about it? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's his way of doing life. And all of these things will be given to you as well. I am a big believer in this principle right here. This is the principle of the first, putting God first in every single area of your life. You put God first in an area of your life, God blesses that part of your life. And I've seen it so many times. And, and when I saw it for the first time, I was 15 years old. Uh, my dad had preached a sermon 
uh, that he had used the text uh, out of Matthew chapter 12 about the widow who went to the to the uh, temple and she gave two mites or two what would be for us like two pennies. Everybody else is putting money in the temple treasury box, a lot of money, some of them. And Jesus is watching them. Him and his disciples are watching people put money into the temple box, tre treasury box. Here comes this woman, this widow. She puts in two tiny coins, very small coins and drops them in and, and Jesus is like, hey, did you see that? Did you see that? That woman, she just put in more than anybody else. And the disciples, I'm sure, did not understand what he was getting at, so he continued. He said, everybody else gave out of their abundance, but she gave all that she had to live on. I was so inspired by that story <clears throat> that I went home and I found everything, every bit of money that I had in my room in my top uh, sock drawer, you know, socks and underwear and some loose change and, I, and, and in my desk drawers and uh, my piggy bank, everything else, all the money that I had to my name and I took it the very next week, uh, turned 16 on Saturday, by the way, of that week and took it to church the next Sunday, put it in the offering. No fanfare, just put everything that I had in the offering. I'm like, here you go, Lord, here's my all. And uh, next week I got my driver's license, very first trip, I took, in a, I took in a car by myself uh, without my mom or dad was I went to the sporting goods store in town. I took a friend at lunchtime from high school. He needed a batting glove. We drove to the local sporting goods store. Uh, it was not a trip without drama. Um, <clears throat> first trip without mom and dad. Um, uh, I hesitate to tell this because my mom's in the service, but it was... Uh, <clears throat> It was her car and I'm driving down a hill. We're about out of gas. I don't know why you didn't put gas in your car, mom, but we're, <clears throat> we're about out of gas. So I shifted into neutral and turned it off so we could just roll down the hill thinking we could save gas. I didn't realize the steering would lock, steering wheel lock. We went up onto the curb and down the sidewalk. And uh, no harm, no foul, no harm, no foul. Uh, we didn't hit anything, turned the car back on, drove to the sporting goods store, forget that part of the story. Mom, uh, got to the sporting goods store. Within five minutes, I had a job. The guy, the, the guy who owned the store, whose funeral I did a year ago, the guy who owned the store just engaged me in conversation, gave me a job. I started that day after school. And I worked at that store for the next four years, bought, bought two cars, uh, bought all my clothes from that point on. And since then, and I'm just telling you, it's just a weird deal. I was like, wow, God, I did. You know, I stepped it out in faith. I trusted in you and you supplied big time. And that was the first time I was wowed by God. I'm just gonna tell you, I've been wowed by God many times since. And many of you could give similar testimonies how God has just shown up when you put him first. This is the principle of the first, putting the blesser above the blessings and being blessed by God because of it. Let's go back to Philippians chapter four. Remember, this is the, the, the section of scripture where Paul's saying, I know what it is to have a lot. I know what it is to have a little, little bit. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, this is verse 19, same chapter. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We put God first, he takes care of our needs. We put God first, are we gonna get rich if we put God first? Uh, that's what they teach at the prosperity churches. This is not a prosperity church if you have not figured that out. Here's, here's what we teach at New Hope. My God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That's what we believe. Doesn't say, and my God will meet all of your greeds. It says he'll meet all of your needs. David said in Psalm chapter 37, verse 25, he said, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their children begging bread. Meaning you put God first, God's gonna take care of his children. He's gonna take care of his children. And part of putting God first is doing what he says, which includes these financial principles that we're talking about over these three weeks. We can't just say that we love Jesus, drop a check in the offering plate at church and then, and then go be stupid with the blessings that we have remaining. This is about 
all of the things that God has blessed us with. His financial principles are about all of our lives and about what we do with everything that he has given to us. We can't expect to be stupid and God to bail us out every week. But he's showing us, he's showing us in his word how we can get to a place of financial peace, but we have to follow the principle. So here it is, when it comes to the map, are you here? Are you trusting God and not the money? Do you trust God? Do you trust him completely? Not the money, not anything else. Listen, money can't save you. I don't care how much money you have. Can't save you. Elon Musk can't save you. Do you know that? Somebody say amen. Elon Musk can't save you. Jeff Bezos can't save you. Bill Gates can't save you. Warren Buffett can't save you. Money cannot save you. Only God can save you. Good news, he wants to save you. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but wants everyone to come to repentance, meaning turn away from our own way and follow his way. And because of God's love for us, he sent his only begotten son to die in our place, to take the wrath for our sin. He took it on himself, not so that we could become the richest person on the block, not so that we can drive a nicer car than everybody else, but he took that wrath on us so that we could become children of God with an eternal inheritance so that we could have our heavenly father providing for every need while we're here on this earth. How do you get that? You get it by not trusting the money or your own works or trusting in people. You don't get it by trusting in anything else except for God. Hey, you thought we were talking about money, didn't you? This is spiritual, man. This is spiritual. We're talking about, we're talking about our Lord. We're talking about having a good relationship with him. We're talking about him being our provider and believing that he's our provider. True story. This is going the wrong direction. But you can be going the right direction today in a relationship with God, headed toward financial peace in a crazy, crazy world. It's possible. Now at all of our campuses, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you've never stepped over that line of faith, uh, as we dismiss our services, there will be prayer partners down at the front of the room. You can come and visit with them. They'll help you if you need prayer for anything. Come on down before you leave. Would you stand with me, please? Love you guys, glad you're here. Hopefully you'll come back next week, okay? And we'll get into some more of these financial principles out of God's word. Now let's bow. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us enough to help us. And sometimes, Lord, we don't get it. Please forgive us when we don't get it. But help us to get it right. Um, you're so kind and loving to us. You provide for us. May we, Lord, look to you for the answers and not to anyone else or anything else. We pray this in the blessed name of your son, Jesus, and all the people said. God bless, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching this message here on the New Hope Church YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button to stay connected. Also find us on your favorite podcast app and on social media at New Hope Church TV. We'll see you next time.